Hi, I'm Mike. I'm here with Aaron Bedra. Aaron has uh, contributed to the Clojure language. He's also spoken uh, extensively on Clojure and functional programming and all kinds of other neat stuff here at GeekFest and well, a few uh, conferences like No Fluff, Just Stuff, uh, RailsConf, and uh, uh, also Clojure Conj? Yeah, Clojure okay. Conj, Strange Loop. Okay, we, right now uh, we're just looking at the relaunch of the Closure Cohen's website, and I just want to ask. Uh, this is a teaching tool, Closure Cohen's. It's a, it's a teaching tool for for. Well, can you describe what Closure Cohen's is? Yeah, so the whole thing actually started. Um, uh, Jim Wyrick and Edgecase had put together the Ruby Cohen's for mm -hmm. um, you know learning Ruby, exploring the language. Mm -hmm. Uh, they were really well done. I uh, I picked them up, just wanted to see what was going on, and I really enjoyed the the teaching style. Uh, right. I really like how that works, and that style of you know explain something very some simple concept and show how it mm -hmm. works is also um, uh, presented in, in like the Little Lisper and the Reason mm -hmm. Schemer and, and and those books. And I really like that kind of very close one to one teach a small concept yeah. and, and kind of evolve it. And you're also so close to the source code. You're not in another tool and a little website yeah, or something like that. And, and you know, you, a small amount of work can be done to just kind of bend the language mm -hmm. a, a, into a little DSL. You know, and Ruby and, and Clojure mm -hmm. both have some some great ways to do that. So you kind of bend it to your will and make it work the way you want, and you kind of create this little learning environment. Um, so I, I tried to mimic um, what Jim had done with the Ruby cones mm -hmm. uh, very closely because I like that style. Right. And uh, and then after that, you know, Colin Jones of Aplight right. actually took. I mean, he's he's contributed. I think way more than I have at this point. Um, <laughs> he I, really put his arm. Yeah, you know, he, he saw it, he embraced it, and really went with it. Um, and the new Closure Codes website is actually a product of Aplight as well. Right. Um, and it's guys, written in Closure. It well. is. It is the uh, judo the judo framework. Yeah. Uh, and so you know, those guys really took. Uh, they they did all the work here. Uh, right. It really wasn't me. I started, I started the project back in 2010 mm -hmm. um, at CodeMesh. Oh, okay. Um, so this was actually a project at. A conference. Yeah, so that, at, at Code Master 2010, um, a full bunch of folks had talked about you know the Ruby Cones. They 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 were becoming popular at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, with said, hey, what about a set of functional language cones? So we actually started the project as a collection of Scala and F Sharp, Closure. Um, uh, I don't remember who, a lot of these people participated. Yeah, because it originally was just kind of functional, and you just had an umbrella. Yeah, this kind of seems to focus on. Yeah, so the Scala forked off into their own repository um, over into Bitbucket, mm -hmm. and and those kind of they're they're much more popular there now. Right. Um, and so Colin and I talked about just making our own uh, closure cones, okay. and that's kind of where that came from, and everything kind of started there. Since then, it's actually forked off to its own engine, mm -hmm. and then all you do is provide exercises. Oh, okay. And so, so other people have approached about doing things like the Cascalog cones mm -hmm. and maybe the CoreLogic cones. And but they have the, uh, it's not known like a plugin. Yeah, there's a there's a Linux plugin, and there's an, an engine you install, uh, and it actually will set up a cone for whatever cones project for whatever you want. Oh, okay. And then you just add the cones. Yeah, you just add the exercises and go. So it's oh, actually a nice little modular thing now, um, and it's it's become kind of a nice little way to mm -hmm. to start to teach uh, something about your project or some concept. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this was just, the closure Codes is about the language. Um, right. Uh, no add-ons, no plugins. Um, the way it's built is, you know, pretty pretty simple, just using a couple of macros and, and uh, some some little tricks. Okay. So. And uh, I'm going to jump straight from uh, closure Codes to talk about some of, uh, uh, some more education you've done through your book. Yeah. Uh, you you co-authored with, um, no, uh, Stuart with, Holloway. Yeah, I just, I knew it was Stuart. I wasn't going to say smaller, or <laughs> but uh, but you co-authored a book with him. Uh, what was that like uh, coming from closure and being a coder and then writing a, a technical book? Uh, so technical books are you know this, I think this is my this is my first um, big book right. Yeah. I've done I've done work for Peep Code for Jeffrey mm -hmm. Grossenbach. Um, I wrote a small book on rail security several years mm -hmm. back. Uh, it was much smaller, so this was right. a bigger endeavor. Um, uh, about 300 pages, the, this book ended up being, and so, and it, but it was the second edition of Stu's book, uh, so th there was already a foundation. So, okay. it was much more daunting than the Peep Code book for me, but it was also less because it wasn't, uh, you know, a blank slate. Right, you and know? so with that, it, I mean, you you you'd been you've obviously been doing uh, closure for a very long time, and you've contributed to the code base. How much of writing the book was having to learn new stuff versus hand? Codifying things you already knew. I definitely learned stuff yeah. during the process of writing the book. Um, a lot of it was brain dump, right? It was right. so that that part was nice. It was pretty easy. I was working in closure every day. Mm -hmm. I was working on the language at least one day a week, um, yeah. if not all week sometimes. 
And so it was nice to be able to kind of brain dump because uh, I was right in the middle of it all. Right. Um, and I think that makes for a good, a good uh, conversation. Did you ever have a point where you're like writing the book and then you're like, wow, I, when you're researching, you're like, I've been doing it wrong all along. And then like changed what you were, how you were, uh, you like know, when you were in digging deep maybe into a topic. I think it might have changed the way I... I did some things in closure, but not for the book. Uh, for the book, it was you know still pretty introductory teaching concepts, and those concepts really didn't change much. Right. Um, between the two versions of the book, um, some of the some of the code and examples changed quite right. a bit, um, and that was based on learning new stuff of the language and and evolving the language. Right. right. Um, the first edition that Stuart wrote was kind of pre 1.0, right around 1.0, and this this book is targeted at 1.3 and up. Okay. Um, so the language had evolved quite a bit, and between Closure 1.0 and 1.3, there were lots of changes. Um, so, so if somebody picks up the book, it's still relevant? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, this is, you know, a couple things have been released since then, uh, mm -hmm. but there are, this, this book is still very relevant. Um, you won't find code examples broken or anything like that. Nothing has changed interface-wise. Um, oh, okay. So the code examples would still work even if you used them with, you know, 1.4 or 1.5, okay. as far as I know. Um, right. I've, I've tried some, most of them, so. Okay. And, uh, you know, just the last kind of group of questions is you've, you've gone and, and spoken at a lot of different conferences. Yeah. Uh, you've gone in RailsConf, uh, No Fluff, Just Stuff, ClosureCon, very different communities. Yes. Just in those three conferences. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you talk about different topics or do you tend to like have the same topic but maybe you tailor it for that audience? So I talk about different stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, definitely tailored for the audience. Always tailored for the audience. Um, having a good conversation where everybody's on the same page is really important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the idea of a talk is more to inspire than it is to teach. Right. Because uh, you only have a short amount of time, right? right. Uh, you really can't teach somebody, uh, uh, you can't teach a group of 100 to 1,000 people much in an hour. Right. right? That's, Brian Lyle basically said the same thing. It's, you come out, you do a little entertainment, you share some knowledge, and then you try to get them to go and... Yeah, it, it's really about inspiring. It's mm -hmm. about somebody taking away something you said that excited them, and mm -hmm. then going and researching and, and learning on their own. And you might have just fueled that, that, that learning. And that's what my, the goal of my conference talks really are, is to, to fuel uh, exploration. Okay. And just uh, when you're preparing for your presentations, are, are you one of those types of people that likes to sit down and figure out, this is my script, or do you kind of just say, I know this thing, here's the general gist of what I want to talk about? I always write an outline. Um, okay. So I'll fire up Emacs in org mode and write an outline. And um, you know that has gotten me through lots of things. Okay. Um, and the reason I do that is because I guess the story is important. And mm -hmm. when you break that down, it, it, it gets rough to follow. Right. Um, and if, you go, if you're moving really fast, because uh, you know, an hour is not a long time, so you have right. to move quickly. If you skip a beat and go off somewhere else and don't really transition well, it's hard to follow. Yeah, you can, um, if you get off a too hard of a script. Yeah, so that, that outline that outline helps make sure the story is mm -hmm. going to go the same place from start to finish. And then okay. after that, I fill in the details and slides. Do you ever uh, go and do, like, uh, some, some people like to uh, kind of work the user group circuit. <laughs> sure. They, do, do you go in and do uh, pre-presentations pre at user groups to try out? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Mm -hmm. um, it just depends on what's around, what user groups are happening. Um, I'll use GeekFest here at Groupon as, right. as a platform sometimes. It happens more regularly uh, every, every week. Right. Um, so there's more chances to hit there. Um, you, know, you never know whether or not you're going to be around on a certain user group night. And you know, they only happen once a month, so it's right. harder. But yeah, your user groups are definitely uh, a great place to, to test ideas. Okay. All right, great. Well, thank you very much for taking no, the time you. to sit down. Thanks.